Hello, welcome to Bedroom Builds at the From Python to Rust series, episode 7, Structs. Coming from the last episode where we talked about pattern matching. Structs in Rust are basically only holding structured data in memory for you. If you want to have methods, um, then you would have to implement them using traits. So a uh, struct is not the same as a class in Python, although you can treat them very similarly because on the basis it's actually just the data, no methods assigned to this whatsoever. If you need to uh, move your API from a Python that uh, relies on the class attributes that allow you to have uh, what is, would basically be a static attribute assigned to your struct in Rust, this is not possible. The, this behavior is also really hard to re-implement or copy if you want because in Python it can actually happen that your class attributes transform into an instance attribute depending on usage. So all of these side effects kind of getting them over to Rust will be hard or not possible. Constructors normally follow the idiomatic guidelines. So you would uh, create a method for your struct called the new to write the instantiation code. So there's no dunder in it like magic method that is always the same. You can choose to use a different one if you want to, a different name of the function. Uh, magic methods like representing your struct as a string or overloading operators and many more things are all supplied by traits. So if you implement the trait, you will also have those features. Uh, I will not discuss object-oriented uh, programming features like inheritance and uh, other stuff. This will be done in a future episode. Let's hop over to the code. In our code here on the left, we have a normal uh, class definition in Python. So we have our class, we gave it the name A, just to have any example. Then uh, we implement the dunder init method that takes a self, gets the actual arguments x and y, and below we do the classic uh, self x equals the argument and self y equals the other argument. With this we can instantiate our class, you can see this uh, below here. And in Rust, the struct a only holds data, so we define it with the keyword struct as you can see up here, and we give the same name A. We have X, now we have to decide about our data type. I chose to use I32 for both. And once this is done, we can instantiate it uh, like shown in line 11. Down here, you can see, I simply define it using the let keyword again. I will define it immutable, use my variable name equal to the class or struct in this case with the curly braces I would then take the attribute 1 in this case x gets the value 1 and y gets the value 2 and I have my struct instantiated now in my memory I have something where I can call as you can see down here a.x and do an operation on it same can be done in uh, python looks very similar and uh, then we have our class B that demonstrates the Python feature of uh, class attributes. So the members is actually in the namespace of class B if you want. And I can still access it. So if I create my init function that takes an X and uh, accesses this members, you will actually have a, a side effect that I will show you right uh, now. So the side effect that I'm talking about can be shown by running the Python program. And this means I can run uh, Python uh, classes pi. And uh, what you can see is that I am instantiating a b twice into two uh, variables, b1 and b2, using the argument 1 and uh, 2. And then I would print the members. And the normal you would expect uh, for these members, if this was an instance attribute, to only hold the respective here 1 and in this case 2. But as you can see in the output, both classes hold 1, 2, the appended values from the constructor. This can be a wanted side effect, 
or uh, a nice way of uh, abstracting some uh, APIs, but this will not be possible to implement in Rust. Just uh, the first line of output is simply uh, demonstrating that we can add stuff to our X in this line and then print it. Let's go back to the Rust code. And let's try to compile uh, this Rust code because uh, as you can see here, I, I tried to replicate it with uh, the static keyword, the members, but uh, normally the Rust compiler will not let us do that. Let's see if this is true. So Rust C structs RS. And uh, yeah, it is confused by this uh, thing. If uh, we wanted to m mirror that, it would be very elaborate. I don't know how to do it. Uh, you maybe can tell me in the comments below how to pull this off. I will now save it without this code, run the compilation and it uh, runs fine. There's one more cool feature that I have to explain in the code. So we created up here our instance of A using X1 and Y2 and below I create uh, another instance of our struct A using Y with the value 4. But then I wrote uh, dot dot A. What this is doing, if you need to create a similar instance of the same struct, you can uh, use this as a an update of the rest of the values. So in this case it only updates x for us and we don't have to explicitly type x1 here. We only wanted to change y and this way we, if we change our code only on the one location up here, this line down here will be updated for us as well. And then the output you can see that. So the x value of our a is a 3 and of the updated one is also 3 and we didn't actually explicitly write it, we just used this update uh, notation with the two dots. And below we can see that our y that we've given for the updated instance is 4 and the other one is 2. Back to the code and let's hop over to my next example. I have also prepared uh, how to deal with uh, default values. So I have the default uh, Python code here and here as well for Rust. Given the fact that Rust does not support uh, function overloading or default arguments for functions, you have to use their alternative uh, ways of doing those operations. So what you can see on uh, the left is a very common way of doing things in Python. So you have your class and your init function and uh, it's not really necessary to provide the value for z here. So we just use none. If the person provides something, we use uh, the value here in our line. Uh, we use z only if z is not none. If it is none, we actually use zero as a default. That can be very useful for the users of your library. And below here, we actually do that. We instantiate our D with only giving X and Y and it will still work out for us. Below, we use the Dunder str magic function to have a string representation of our object. I chose to use just the D parentheses and then X, Y and Z to print it. On the right, there's much more code going on because I'm showing you two ways of how you can uh, do this with optional arguments. The first line I will get back to once uh, I will explain the implementation. The struct has those uh, three attributes and uh, their types defined. And here we uh, derive the debug trait. So this gets a default implementation uh, for debug printing. Debug printing, as you can see at the very bottom, is using this uh, colon question mark notation inside the curly braces for the formatter and uh, will 
by default implement just the default printing of all of those attributes in order. So this way you actually already are dealing with a trait, although it will be magically done for you by the macros preprocessor. Then uh, the way I said on the start of the presentation, how to create a constructor is uh, by convention using the method called new. Then uh, you can give it the arguments that will help construct your struct correctly. In this case, we have the three arguments as we do here in Python. So we have our x, our y, and our z. However, z is special. It has the option argument where I then would uh, define the optional i32 this way. And uh, it returns, I can use uh, self because if I implement the D, I know I'm talking about the struct called the D and I can use self. This will help me if I ever ch ch choose to rename uh, my struct. I will only have to rename it up here and of course here in the impl section. And then my code is updated. Very helpful. Now options, as we have seen already in pattern matching, can then be deconstructed by the match construct. So we match for Z up here. And then in the case of there is some value in our option, we construct the object uh, this way. So we take our mandatory attributes X and Y. And since the user provided Z, we, provide, we use his uh, Z value that has been extracted by the pattern matcher into this uh, Z. If it was not provided, so the user provided none, we provide the default value zero. The other way of doing this is we import, and this is the first line now that is important, we import the trait default, and then we implement it for our struct D. So we implement the default for D. All we have to do now is implement a method called default, that returns our struct instance the way we want to it to behave by default, which we do by setting all the attributes to zero. And then below here, we use the code to do this. So I'm using D, then two times the colon to denote I want to get something out of the namespace for this struct, use the new, and I actually do it. I use the one, two, and the none. And uh, below is the alt other alternative. So instantiating the two using also one and two. And then I use, like we've seen before with uh, the update method, dot dot. And then I provide the defaults for this object. Um, let's run this code. Now that you've seen those two options, it will be interesting to see if this actually works. So Rust C defaults RS, happily compiles and runs. And we get exactly the same output uh, twice. <clears throat> and you can see that this uh, Debug output does for us provide it in the same way as we would actually write it in code. And also there's a difference between those two ways of doing it. If you provide the, the new function or the new method, you make X and Y mandatory. If you use the, the default trait, you actually provide the default values for all of those. This means that if people are using the default, you can actually instantiate this without providing X and Y values. So if you want to enforce people have to provide X and Y in your API, you would actually go with this way of doing it. If you just want to have a convenient way of constructing your object, in any case, you can use the implementation of your default trait. 
to quickly demonstrate the, the difference that I just uh, noted, I will hop over here and uh, remove this line, save it, go back to my Rust shell, compile it, run it, and uh, now we can see that y became zero because I didn't provide it since I was not forced to do it because the default trait implements it in a way where it gives me the value zero and uh, then uh, my struct behaves maybe differently than intended. So take care that these are just two options of how to do it. You may implement uh, both of them but you may also choose to only use one of the two depending on the requirements of your software. Thanks for watching. Coming up next on the From Python to Rust series are hash maps.